Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy J-Rock. Today I'm going to be hitting you with another review. Today we're going to be reviewing a uh, graphic novel. This is X-Men Epic Collections, The Gift. You see the title right there. Uh, what I like about these is they have their own, have their own uh, self-title, but in the back it lets you know it's volume 12. When it comes to these superhero books, there's just they just keep going and going, so... You don't necessarily need to start from volume 1 up to volume 12. You could just start in any volume. They all have their own, I wouldn't say self-contained stories because you would need to know a little back matter. But you could pretty much just buy one of these. They're pretty chunky. They got about 20 issues each. And you'll, you'll get the, the majority of what's going on. Okay, now this particular one, it has, um, it, it contains issues. Uncanny X-Men 189 to 198. Then it has a Nightcrawler miniseries, issues 1 through 4. Uh, X-Men Annual number 8. And uh, it also has an Alpha Flight miniseries, a two-issue story arc. Okay, so we're going to have about three, since, uh, about three stories of X-Men in here. Then the two miniseries. So it's going to be about five stories. I'll try to review them uh, each separately. All right, the first uh, story arc, it starts off with Rachel Summers and Amy, uh, a.k.a. Magma, I believe her name is. They're the two main characters in this story arc. Magma's more of a new mutant than the X-Men. And we get introduced to a, a new Black Queen. So there's a new Black Queen, and this includes the Hellfire Club. So this is this, that's the villain for the first story arc. And right when the when you open up the book, this is a trope in the X-Men uh, mythos where constantly one of the X-Men will leave the team and they'll be in the airport station saying their goodbyes, hug, hug, kiss, kiss, right? So that's where this starts out. Storm recently lost her powers, so she wants to leave the X-Men. She's like, there's no need for me being here. I got no superpowers. Even though Storm, without superpowers, is still very capable. She has a lot of, uh, she knows how to fight. Like She knows how to fight with sticks and do all kinds of stuff. She was doing back in the jungles and, and in Africa and so forth. So she's very capable, but not to the level of super powered mutants or super powered uh, humans. So she feels she would just be in the way. Now that first issue with the Hellfire Club, it's very filler. Nothing really important happens. It's kind of a, a self-contained story in one issue. All it does is really sow the seeds for, for what's to come for the following issues. It, they show this necklace, so they zoom in on it and so forth, so you know it's important. It has some type of mythical powers. So in the next issue, doesn't explain anything. Next thing you know, you're in this fantasy world where Captain America is dressed like Conan and Storm is dressed like Sheena the Amazonian and everybody's like knights with swords and so forth. I think Nightcrawler's like a pirate. So all of a sudden, we're in this fantasy world and they're fighting this... um. Evil Sorcerer, no explanation how we got there, we're just there, and no explanation how the Avengers are here, nothing, so it's very confusing right there, I don't know what the hell happened, I don't know if you have to read other stuff in the Avengers books, that shows how they got here, but the point is we're here, and this is basically Chris Claremont trying to write a Conan story with the X-Men characters, very uh, sword and sorcery type of thing, it's not very it's not very good, it's kind of kind of weak, and um, it really, it's easily skippable. This really contains nothing that you need to know, or nothing that affects future story arcs in the X-Men ongoing series. One cool thing you do get here is, um, you get a cool fight scene with Storm and Callisto from the Morlocks. They always go at it, they're always kind of like rivals, fighting to be the leader of the Morlocks all the time. Some, more, the majority of the time it's Callisto, but sometimes it's Storm because she has beaten her a few times in battle. So they get a cool fight, and it's always cool to see them fight each other. Then they team up because Callisto's not completely all bad. She has some good in her. She's just a leader trying to help out her people. So it shows them in this mythical world or this fantasy realm. Uh, both of them without superpowers, and they show how capable they both are. So that's one thing you do get in this story. You get... Two badass ladies that know how to take care of themselves. And Chris Claremont, he's always been, uh, he's like a feminist, right? He's always been ahead of the curve. He was doing this in comics back before when the the 
girl superheroes didn't get major roles. He was always constantly introducing a lot of female superheroes into the X Men universe that other titles weren't really doing at the time. Back in the like seventies and early eighties, he was always constantly including new members, and there were he wanted it to be just as many women superheroes as guy superheroes on the team, and for them to be just as important. Now in this story, it's clear there are the two main characters: is Callisto and Storm. Next issue will be one of the guys, and the next story arc will be one of the girls again. He takes his time developing each character, devoting six or seven issues to one character, then six or seven to another, which can be hard to juggle sometimes when you're dealing with so many characters in a team. Sometimes you just get stuck and always concentrating on Wolverine, right? And he's the badass, he's doing everything, and you, the rest of the characters just fall behind, right? They take a back seat, and they lack in development and in interesting uh, character moments. Uh, Chris Claremont always made sure everybody got their camera time. And uh, he always made sure the girls were just as heroic. They weren't just damsels in distress. So this definitely shows here in the first story arc. So issues 189 to 192, that's where we're at right now. It's the fantasy story with the Conan stuff going on. And you have John Romita Jr. doing the art, which usually he's not an X-Men artist. At this time, it's usually Dave Cockrum. It's um, uh, Paul Smith or uh, John Byrne. So yeah, we had uh, John Romita, that's kind of interesting. He gives you some, the story's not the greatest, but he gives you cool action scenes during these whole three, four issues. So if you like that, you'll be highly entertained with this. Now we're on issue, now we're on issue 192, we start on to the next story arc. This one's a good one. Um, I like what they did here. Uh, they introduced this character named Nimrod, right? He's like a future Sentinel. If you've seen the movie X-Men Days of Future Past, those Sentinels that can mimic and absorb your powers and then then they have the same powers that's nimrod but in the future in the future there's only one of him and in the movie there was a lot of them right so he's introduced here and you're developing this new villain now but he's not all villain he's not all bad so i'll get i'll get to that right now in a minute what i mean by that so now storm goes back to joining the team and we get some character development with rachel summers aka she's the daughter of uh cyclops right but she's from the future she comes back to the past and then she's like oh this is my father whatever and we don't know much else about her except that she came from the future on this story arc uh, called x-men days of future past back in issue 142 so she gets introduced there and now she's in the x-men universe we don't know how she got to the future how been right so here they start touching a little bit on her backstory she's from the future so forth and her powers is like Professor Xavier. She's a mind reader, te telekinesis, and so forth. She meets her, who she believes to be her mom. Someone Cyclops is dating at that time. A.K.A. Scott Summers, right? And she could read her mind that she's pregnant. And she finds out it's a, it's a male. She goes, wait a minute, that's not me. She's having a boy. She's supposed to have a girl. So does that mean I'm not going to be born in the future? This and that. So... It gets a little interesting there. It asks more questions than it gives you answers. It just asks a lot of questions, and you will probably have to read the following book to find out the answers, right? That's how they get you. That's how that's how these comics reel you in. They ask all kinds of questions, then you want to know what's happening, what are the answers, gotta buy the next volume. Okay, so if you don't know, if you're not familiar with X-Men, obviously in the future, the, the kid she's pregnant with is Cable. That's another thing Chris Claremont he plays the long game. He sows the seeds, sets up stories that he's going to do in the future. So he sets up that this woman is pregnant, setting up to introduce a new character, which will be Cable. And he won't be introduced until three years later. So, so he's three years ahead. He's writing a story now, and he knows where it's going three years from now. So he already has everything scheduled according to, to the way he wants to happen, everything over the years. He doesn't just wing it month to month. You know what I mean? So it takes a lot of... Uh, a lot of forward thinking, if you will. He thinks ahead all the time. Now, towards the end of issue 192, uh, Professor Xavier, he's a teacher. He gives a lot of speeches, and he's also a politician. So he's constantly giving uh, political speeches, like on CNN and stuff, speaking up for um, mutant rights and so forth. Kind of think out sharpener or something, something along those lines, right? So he's always doing that kind of stuff. But, and he speaks at colleges and so forth. He's also a professor to kind of educate people. So 
he's walking out of his uh, class. He just taught a course in or whatever. And some of the students there from another class, they kind of found out, they kind of hinted at, they, they have an idea that he's a mutant. They're like, I think he's one of those superpower mutants. That's why he defends mutants so much. So immediately they, uh, they just beat the crap out of Professor Xavier. And physically, he has no physical powers. He's not strong. He can't fight. He just telekinetically, he could, he could stop them and mind control them. But he doesn't want to abuse his powers. So he takes this beating that's so unnecessary. He could have just stopped them with his mind. And uh, it's a little bit of a touch on racism. Somehow, as soon as somebody thinks somebody else is different, people can sometimes be ignorant and stuff. And this is stuff that maybe was happening in the 70s. It doesn't happen so much now, but not saying it doesn't exist. Just not as common. It's more of like big groups nowadays. Group uh, against other groups. But anyways, I thought that was interesting. But I thought uh, the writer here, Claremont, kind of dropped the ball there. Like he could have done something interesting with that story. And, and uh, you know, maybe gave a little moral to the story, how that's wrong. Like touched on it a little more. And we just immediately went back into superhero stuff again, right? So I thought he could have done something with that. And another thing is, in the middle of the story, right when he's when they're jumping Professor Xavier, it stops that issue and it goes into this X-Men Alpha Flight miniseries that completely kills the flow of this big moment that just happened. They're just beating them up. Then it goes to this other story. After that miniseries is over, we continue on with issue 193. So that kind of, I thought it wasn't in this book. They didn't put them necessarily in the right order. And two, I, I would Skip that and continue this story first, then go back to that. If uh, for anybody that buys this book and is reading that, I would do it that way. It would just make more sense. The X Men Alpha Flight issue, it has nothing to do with the continuity, but it does touch a little bit again on little character development with Rachel Summers and Kitty Pride being the two main characters in the next story. And again, you know, like the women leading the team and the stories heavily based on them. So that's always fun, but uh, that story completely has nothing to do with, with the main story, and they just killed the flow right there for me. Now we get back to Nimrod, the Sentinel from the future as well, right? Now he's programmed to attack anybody with a weapon. Like if a human's carrying a gun, that's a threat. If a mutant's not carrying a gun, but he has superpowers, that's a threat. He'll, he'll read it, right? He's programmed to... To uh, attack people that are a threat. Think Robocop. He was kind of a play on Robocop right here. Nimrod. Which this also came out. These stories. Came out around the time of the Robocop movie. And these uh, comic writers and so forth. Tend to borrow. From what's going on in pop culture. And movies. And the news. And sports. Whatever. And they borrow ideas from there. And then they give it their own twist. Right. And then they write a story about them. And vice versa. Sometimes movies do the same. They borrow from books. And kind of copy the stories. And. And just set it in a different realm or a different genre, so on and so on. So this guy's basically um, Robocop. He shows up to the past, gunning down mutants, because that's his job. In the future, he's supposed to stop mutants, right? And right away, this is something a lot of writers do when they when you're introduced to a new character. Uh, they immediately have them fight somebody so that they win their first fight all the time. But depending on who they pick, so you could have an idea of. How powerful they are. Like will he be Jubilee. So you know he's not that powerful. He's just stronger than Jubilee. So him they immediately have a fight Juggernaut. Which at this time Juggernaut was one of the. Top villains on the X-Men universe. He was as powerful as the Hulk. So they immediately have a fight Juggernaut. And he wins that battle that uh, he's beating on Juggernaut. So the X-Men see Juggernaut losing that fight. So they come to help Juggernaut. So, so you could get an idea that he's more powerful than Juggernaut. So he's pretty strong. But then they give it this twist where he doesn't attack humans. So he's not necessarily bad. He's just a robot and that's the way he was programmed. So humans love him. They're like, yeah, he's you know, rooting for him. Yeah, Nimrod's the real deal. Like He's here to um, help us from these mutants and so forth. So people see him as a superhero. They see him like they would see Iron Man or... Captain America, they see them one way because they're humans, and they see mutants a totally different way, even though they're also X-Men and so forth, they're doing the same thing, but since they're like, they use the mutant uh, tag as, as a metaphor for minorities in the comics, 
and then they give them that they're all from different countries. Colossus is from Russia, Wolverine's Canadian, and they're all from different parts of the world, right? And the Avengers are all white. So it's a little like um little metaphor there that even though they're also doing the right thing, they see them differently because of of uh who they are basically. So Nimrod was a very interesting character to me. This is the introduction to him. And you see he's a very at this point in time, like he's a very conflicted uh character. Like he's programmed to do certain things. But it's almost like he's a robot, but it's almost like he's becoming sentient. Like like he's almost like he's starting to think for himself and ask questions of why is he programmed this or why the why should he do this just because he was told to. It's like he's kind of like having that that uh that uh struggle within itself. So that's all we see in this book. We don't get to see any further. Maybe in the next volume they'll touch a little more on him. But at this point in time, he's very, it's a coin toss. You don't know if he's going to lean good guy or if he's going to lean villain. You, you really don't know what's going on with him quite yet. All in all, if you're an X-Men fan and you collect all the X-Men books, you're going to get this one. If you read most of them, but you haven't read all of them, you're going re to want to read this one because it has interesting character development. Like it has, it brings up some stuff that you're going to need to know, that you're going to want to know. But if you're just a casual reader and you just want to pick up an X-Men book with a good story, um, I skip this one. This is not one you need. This is more for the hardcore fan that just needs to know every detail because it has a few important ones there. But if you just want a fun story, uh, look elsewhere. This one's one of the weaker stories in my opinions as far as X-Men. Uh, there's a lot better ones to start off with. And this wouldn't necessarily be one of them in, in my opinion. It also has the four issue miniseries of uh, Nightcrawler, which I'm not even going to talk about. It's so irrelevant to anything else in the book right here. Uh, overall, I would give this story arc maybe like a 6 out of 10 uh, from a scale 1 to 10. I hope you guys uh, like what you saw. If you have any uh, questions, let me know in the comments down below. If you read this before, let me know your opinions. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, again, write them in the comments down below. I can't wait to read the next one for sure. And you know what? If you're interested in seeing the bonus features and a few of the pages or whatever, I'll do another video, uh, just an overview, just flipping through the pages, checking out the quality and so forth, price tag and all the info you're going to need to know. I'll do another video for that, so keep a lookout for it. I'll put the link in the descriptions down below once I do that video so that you could go straight to that one if you wish to. All right, guys, it's been fun. I'll check you guys out next time.